Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you all for coming out so early in the morning. Or maybe for you East Coasters, it's not so early, but for me it is. So anyway, uh, what I'm going to talk about today are sort of three subjects that I uh, encounter a lot in industrial applications, but are not talked about much in the field of machine learning, at least in our textbooks on machine learning. And uh, so I'm going to talk about some research in those areas, uh, which, because in my view, they ought to be more researched. Uh, the, the three areas are robustness. That is, how badly do our how badly does a procedure degrade when the data is generated by a mechanism that does not conform to the assumptions that led to the uh, 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 driving the procedure? The second is accuracy. We have a large number of machine learning algorithms that all make predictions, but they seldom tell you how accurate that prediction is in the sense that how far away is the true value of what you're trying to predict from what you predicted. Now, we can do that on average, but for each individual prediction, we don't do that very often because it's not easy to do, as you'll see. Okay, and then the last thing is censoring. Censoring is something, again, that's not covered in machine learning textbooks. Censoring comes into play when you have less than perfect knowledge about the out value of the outcome variable in your training data. Okay, and then how do you use that incomplete knowledge to learn about, uh, to make predictions when you don't really know the value of the outcome variable in the training sample for each of the observations or some of the observations, but you know something about it and you would like to still be able to make predictions. So let's go back to the very beginning, the machine learning problem. In machine learning, we have some quantity of interest about a system, call it Y, whose value we don't know but would like to know. Okay, we call that the outcome variable, the response variable, uh, the output variable. Okay, but we suppose that that variable, we don't know its value, but we suppose that its value is related to the values of other variables. So Y is some function of the values of other variables, and I've divided the other variables into two types. One I call X, and those are the ones we can observe and measure. And the others I've called Z, those are the other variables that affect the value of Y, but that we can't measure, we don't see. We only see the X's. In our training data and when we make future predictions, we're only going to see the X's. Okay, so our goal is to estimate the expected value or mean of y uh, given x based on training data of previously solved cases where we get to see the values of x and their corresponding values of y. Okay, because we cannot see the z's, if we fix x, we don't fix the value of y. Fixing x makes a distribution of the values of y, okay? And in order to account for that, we need a statistical model. And here's a statistical model that's almost universally used. It's not the only possible one. We say that the outcome variable y is some function of the predictor variables we can observe, okay, plus some scale times a random component. So f of x is the expected value or the mean value or the median value of y given x. And th this part here is a stochastic or random component that accounts for the fact that we cannot exactly predict y with, with x. We have this random component left over, which we uh, call the irreducible error. Now, there's nothing you can do about the irreducible error except take some of these z's and make them x's. That is, measure more of the things that account for the variation of y. Then you can, then you can make smaller the irreducible error. Otherwise, you are stuck with it. OK, now, you should keep in mind that uh, this irreducible error, the one that there's nothing we can do about, is distinct from the reducible error. That is the 
error in predicting the expected value of y given x with our uh, model based on our training data. So this is the difference between the target function, the best possible predicting function, which is this location function here. Okay. And so the reducible error measures how far off our predictions are from the mean of y given x. Okay. And the whole goal of the whole field of machine learning is to try to make this smaller. Try and make models that get closer to the target function. Okay. The goal of statisticians in this business is to try and estimate it. If a statistician gives you a confidence interval on a prediction, they're talking about how far off your prediction is from the mean of y given x. They are not talking about how far off your prediction is from the actual value of y you're trying to predict. They're telling you what, how, how much are you in error in predicting the average value of y, but in any given prediction you don't see the average value of y, you see y. And it's, and the problem is that in almost all cases, at least of ice I've seen, well, the, the overall prediction error is the reducible plus the irreducible. Well, it's a convolution of the two, but it's, it's, it contains both. But usually the irreducible error is much, much larger than the reducible error. The confidence interval for prediction that the statistician gives you, that interval is nowhere near your actual error in making that prediction. Okay. Okay, now the usual assumptions about the irreducible error, at least that statisticians always make, is that the scale of the error, the size of that error is constant over all x's. Over all predictions, this is the same, and it's normally distributed. Okay, and that almost all of statistics and much of machine learn learning is based on that. Whenever you see squared error loss, which is by far the most popular one, you are assuming this. Okay, and we will see that this is seldom ever even close to being true. All right, so let's first examine. Uh, uh, I should have mentioned that, if, that is, we statisticians call the case when this scale function, that is the size of the irreducible error is constant as a function of x, we call that homoscedasticity. I don't know where that term ever came from. Okay, but let's examine that. In order for that to be true, this function that relates y to both the observed and unobserved variables has to have an additive form, and that's most unlikely. I mean, this is, you know, that, uh, that is, there's no interactions between the x's and the z's. And even if you're lucky enough so that this obtains, the joint distribution of the x's and the z's have to conspire such that the scale of g of z given x, that's this guy here, is a constant. So this is just not very likely, and we'll see in a while that it's not even close to being true in most cases. Okay. Here I'd like to show you, this is my attempt at an illustration of the case where you have heteroscedasticity, that is that function is not constant, that different predictions for different joint values of the predictor variables will have sometimes very different errors. Okay, so here I tried to make an example. Suppose the optimal pr prediction in all of these cases is 5. That is f of x equals 5. You would love your machine learning algorithm to predict 5 here. Okay, here's a case where the scale is very small. Okay, and you see that almost all of the y's are close to 5. You're going to get very accurate predictions here. And as that scale increases, the actual values of y get further and further away from 5, which is always the optimal prediction. You should predict 5 in this case just like you would in this case, but here you're going to make on average huge errors for, with this prediction and very small ones with that prediction. Okay, now normality is not very likely either. Uh, the greatest data miner slash scientist of them all, John Tukey, used to say that the small residuals, the small errors may be approximately normal, but the bigger ones have heavier tails. Okay, and that's in every, every, statisticians never say every, but in most cases that I have seen, uh, 
that is the case. There are outliers. The details of the error distribution are not normal. That's rare. Okay. And in fact, you might have what I would call heterodistributionality. What makes anyone think that the distribution in the errors for some of the x's is the same for other predictions and other x's? Might be, a, you know, it might have short tail, nice normal distributions of your errors for some x's, and then have very wide-tailed uh, uh, or other bizarre distributions for uh, at other x's. So how would you deal with that? Well, the way we can deal with heterodistributionality is uh, to appeal to a subject in statistics called robustness. The idea is that you choose a compromise distribution for your errors such that it will work best if the errors have that distribution, but it degrades very slowly as the distribution of your errors has different distributions. Okay? And the normal distribution, which is the one we almost always use, is very bad at that. If you have long tail distributions for your errors, the normal it, it, procedures based on the normal distributions, that is squared error loss, uh, degrade very badly. They don't degrade uh, slowly as things move a little bit away from the normal distribution. Uh, generally, they, they totally fall apart. In fact, every book tells you that before you use procedures like that, you have to go through and, and, and identify and get rid of outliers. Okay. Well, if you had a robust procedure, you wouldn't have to do that. Not only that, uh, outliers are hard to find, hard to detect, because they, they, can be, they can be far from the general trend of y versus x, but not extreme values of y. Okay. So the normal is not good. So what distribution might be good? And here's the one I like. I call it, it's the logistic distribution. I don't call it that. Everyone calls it that. It's the logistic distribution. Okay. And uh, here it is. And here's a little picture of it. And its property is it conforms to what Tukey's uh, razor, you might want to call it. Namely, that in this distribution, the small errors are normal. But the large errors have an exponential distribution, which is a pretty long tail distribution. So we would hope that this distribution would work well, and it does, for a wide variety of real error distributions, none of which will ever be exactly logistic or exactly anything. Okay, so we're going to use the logistic distribution, all of the procedures I'll discuss. Okay, so here's our prediction. We're going to predict y hat. Our prediction y hat will be our estimate for the function f, the mean function, at x. Okay, the mean function is the solution to this problem. Here, epsilon is, is the scaled uh, version of the residual. This is the negative log likelihood. There won't be a quiz after, so don't memorize it, but this is it. Uh, I tend to write things out in detail, so if someone wants to look at the slides later, they, they, they can uh, uh, see more of what's going on. But the interesting thing here, you may wonder why that there's the scale function running around, and clearly this solution is going to depend upon the scale. Okay, the scale function. Now, if the scale function is constant, it's not going to matter, but if it's not constant, it can matter. And if you knew it, you could get better uh, estimates of the actual predictions. Okay. The, the thing is, though, not much better. If all you are interested in is making a prediction, okay, and you know the value of y, then this is minimized when f equals y independent of s. It turns out that s just the scale function just provides a weight for each observation. So if you knew it, you can optimally weight each of your observations uh, when you did the training. But if you don't optimally weight them, it generally doesn't do much damage. So that using an incorrect scale function, namely assuming it's constant when it's not, to estimate the location function increases the variance but not the bias, and it, the assumption that it's constant is usually not too bad. Okay, and so that's why we get a, we, that's why all of our textbooks ignore it, at least the ones that I looked at. Never talk about the irreducible error, how you might go about estimating it. Okay? But I'm going to argue you should estimate it, or try to anyway. 
And here are my reasons. First of all, it will improve the estimate of the location function of your prediction, especially in high variance settings. But it's an important inferential st statistic. It provides a prediction interval. It tells you how accurate your prediction is. Uh, uh, your actual accuracy, not the accuracy of how well you've estimated f hat, but how accurately your prediction of y is at that x. Okay, and in fact, for the logistic distribution, the interquartile range of y given f depends on s. It's uh, twice s, s of x over the square root of 3. And that can affect your decision. I mean, if you're an academic or if you're in a Kegel competition, you really don't care about the uncertainty. You only care about average uncertainty. You don't care about uncertainty of individual predictions because you're not rewarded for that. But in actual industrial applications, the reason why you want to know the value of y, the outcome variable is going to help you make a decision. It's going to tell you, uh, it's, it's going to help you decide what ad to show, whether to issue an insurance policy to someone. It's going to inform a decision, okay? And as a very wise statistician once told me, you should never make a decision based on a numeric quantity unless you have some idea of the uncertainty with which that number, you know that number. If the uncertainty is really large, that will change, that will likely change your decision. So, okay, all right. And then finally, the third thing is that knowing the scale function is crucial whenever you have censoring. So let me tell you about censoring. Because censoring is another thing that is not talked about in our textbooks hardly at all. But in real applications, it happens all the time. And I'll show you some examples later. But this is censoring. Censoring is when you have a training data set where you're given the x's, OK, but you have incomplete knowledge of what y is, OK? In the normal setting that we, in, that we talk about in this textbooks, you are given in the training sample joint values of the predictor variables x and the value of the outcome variable y. In censoring, you're not given the value of the outcome variable y. You are given a range for the outcome of, the ver of y. So, you're, so you, instead of y and x, you have a, b, and x, where a and b are, uh, contain the value of y. But all you know is a and b. You don't know the value of y. And that happens a lot more than you'll ever dream. Okay? So here are some examples. Suppose a equals b. Then the value of y is known, and we're back in the textbook setting. A could be minus infinity, which simply says all we know is that y is less than b. That happens a lot. An example is if you're an insurance company and you want to estimate how good a driver is so that you know whether to uh, issue a policy or not. And so you have a database full of uh, past policies you've issued and how much those policies have cost you. Now, and you're going to use that to try and determine how good the drivers are. It, uh, make a model to predict how good the drivers are. Well, what you will find is that the vast majority of, of policies cost you nothing. There were no claims. That's what you hope if you're the insurance company. Okay. So if you plot the cost of the policy or histogram, it's going to have this uh, humongous spike at zero. Okay. Those are all drivers who have not had accidents. But they probably not all drivers who have not had accidents are equally good drivers. Some are pretty bad. They got lucky. Similarly, some drivers who have had accidents are really good drivers. So you have a data set where you know the cost of some claims, and for most of the claims, you only know that they are less than zero. And in fact, any time you have an outcome variable that cannot be negative, you tend to see pileups at zero, sales, all kinds of things like that. Okay. Another kind of censoring is you can have censoring from above. That is that you know that uh, y is greater than some value, uh, but you don't, know, you don't know how much. So in this case, the upper limit is infinity. The lower limit is the value that it has to be greater. This is the kind of censoring that is discussed at all in textbooks uh, is this, namely in uh, 
in survival studies where you have an experiment where, or where you want to see whether a drug is helping people live longer. Uh, well, so you measure the dosage of the drug you gave to a person, and then you also measure covariates like demographics and other things that might affect how long they live. Okay, and then you try to make a prediction model to predict how long people are going to live. Now, the problem is at some point the funding agency is going to say, uh, produce a result, and some of the people in your experiment may not have died yet. Lucky for them, but not lucky for you because you don't know how long they lived. All you know is they lived longer than the end of the experiment. That's another kind of censoring, okay? And then a third kind of censoring, the one I will talk about the most today, is interval, where both of these are finite. Although the technique I'm going to talk about uh, can handle any of these, and the A's and the B's can be different for each observation. It's I indexes the observation. Okay. Now there is now a special case of, of censoring, okay, which is uh, probably the most used procedure in all of machine learning, is that when the uh, intervals that define the limits of y are disjoint. In other words, you have, if you look at the distribution of y, you break it up into bins. Okay, and then each observation, you know the bin that each observation, you're told the bin that each observation is in and the limits of the bin, where the bin started and where the bin ended. Okay, now if there are only two such bins, this procedure reduces to ordinary binary logistic regression of the kind you've come to know and love. So you can think of logistic, you probably don't think of it that way, but you can think of logistic regression as a standard regression problem. Okay, where there is a continuous outcome variable, but all you are given is its sign, whether it's less than zero or whether it's greater than zero, and that's all you're given. That's classification. And if you assume this logistic distribution for the heirs, that's lo binary logistic regression, as I said, the, the type, kind you've come to know and love. Okay, now if there are more than two such bins, then this turns into multi-class ordered logistic regression. That is the case where you have multi-classes, but the class label has an order. Small, medium, large, extra large, uh, gray, academic grades, A, B, C, D, F, uh, one, uh, uh, Yelp, one, two, three, four stars. Okay, you know what class each observation is in. You know that all, uh, 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 let's uh, all say of uh, all two stars or all one stars are not as good as two stars and all two stars are not as good as three stars etc but you don't know how much and in fact if those of you who have read the guide Michelin to, to find restaurants in Europe and in this country now you know well that a three star restaurant the difference between a three and a two star is much greater than a two star and a one star, which in turn is much greater than a uh, one star and no star, okay? But you don't know how much. So that's a kind of classification where you have a, an ordered class label, okay? And that can be treated as a censoring problem too, just like the two class can. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Well, in a few minutes. Okay, so now here's the setup. We have general interval censoring. This is the likelihood. You'll recognize the logistic cumulative distribution. Okay, the probability that Y is in the interval AB, okay, is uh, the its cumulative distribution up to B minus its cumulative distribution up to A. That depends upon A and B, of course. It also depends upon the location of the observation F and the scale S. Okay. Now the thing is, unlike the case where I knew the value of y rather than just knowing an interval, here the scale function is crucial. It is just as crucial as estimating the location function. You need to estimate both, and here's, uh, I tried to illustrate that here. Here's another situation where the optimal prediction is 5. Okay, but in, in, for some observations when you predict 5, the y's tend to be close to 5 and others tends to be farther away. This is different scales, okay? And so you see that if we're censored at zero, which is very common, the probability of being censored, the probability of being less than zero not only depends upon uh, the location, namely if I change, sorry, if I change the location, uh, 
Okay, I, I would change the probability of being zero if I just uh, rigidly move these distributions, but it also depends upon the scale. So here all these guys are predicted to be at five, but some uh, the probability of being less than zero depends strongly on the scale. All right, so what we're gonna, gonna try to do, what I will do, is develop a procedure based on the logistic distribution so that it is robust, okay, that can handle these kinds of censoring, which is pretty much all censoring. You, uh, you, you, some observations, you may know the value of y, others you may know uh, whether they're less than something or greater than something, or some others you may just know they're in an interval. Okay, so here's our problem, okay. Uh, uh, this is the risk, okay, this is the negative log likelihood, the loss. What we're given for each observation i is a lower and upper bound on y of i, okay, and we're given the x's. And what we have to do is find two functions, not one now, like most machine learning procedures estimate, but two functions, f and s, uh, find the, the, the two functions from some class of functions that minimize this quantity. And here for completeness is the quantity. Okay. So the ordinary machine learning problem, you would assume S is constant and you would not do any, and you would assume A equals B, you would assume you know Y. Okay. So that's the exercise. Now there's one problem. This. Uh, uh, loss here is not convex in S, but it is convex in the inverse of S, so we'll estimate that. And we would like to make the constraint that the scale function is always positive, not uh, greater than zero, or equal, well, it's never equal to zero, greater than zero, so we'll estimate instead of the uh, uh, inverse of S, we'll estimate the log of the inverse of s, which is a negative log of s. Okay, so here's, here's how I'm going to do it, and I'll use gradient boosted tree ensembles. I will express both the location function and the scale function in, a, in an expansion in cart decision trees, and uh, if you want to see how that's done, that's the reference of the paper uh, for doing gradient boosting. Okay. But we have to estimate two functions, a location function and a scale function. Boosting estimates one function, at least. It doesn't have to, by the way. You can, it's easy to modify boosting, so it can estimate as many functions you like on the same data. But if you use off-the-shelf software, then you can do it iteratively, namely you can initially guess that you are homoscedastic, namely that uh, uh, the scale is a constant everywhere, and for, given that, you can estimate f. That's the usual machine learning problem, assuming s is constant, and estimate f. But then, given that f, we can now uh, build a boosted tree ensemble to estimate s, and then given that s, we can go back and estimate the f and iterate until it stops changing. So that's, that's the idea. Okay. Now I can go ahead and do this. I'll make two functions. But as you're aware, especially in this workshop, just presenting two black box models, how do you have any confidence that it's describing anything that's going on in the actual data? So we need some diagnostics, and here is some diagnostics. First of all, we know that the median of y given the location function f has to be f. That's a property of all symmetric distributions, including the logistic. Okay, so this is like a y versus y hat plot. And for the scale, we can do something similar. It turns out for the logistic distribution, the median scale, I mean the median absolute residual given, uh, I've given the scale parameter for that observation is the scale parameter times the log of three, and the log of three is 1.1. And then here's the final one, which is kind of messy, so I'll describe later. But it just says that the probability that y is in some interval, given that f is in another interval, is given by this. This will be important when we're censored and we cannot look at residuals. If we only know that y is in an interval and we predict a value for y, we're not going to predict necessarily what interval it's in. We're going to predict its actual value. Okay, then how do, we, uh, how do we construct a residual to see if the residuals make sense? There are no residuals because we don't know the value of y. And that's when this will come in. All right, so uh, 
as you probably suspect, I generated lots of artificial data sets where I knew the functions that I put in and saw that I got out the right functions, and I won't bore you with that in the limited time. We'll actually see this applied to some actual data sets, some of which you may be familiar because they come from the familiar data repositories. The difference here is we're not going to only try and predict the value of the outcome. We're going to try and uh, also predict an uncertainty on that prediction. Okay, so here's the first data set that I'll uh, entertain. It's the California housing price data. We use this a lot in our book to illustrate a lot of procedures. And it comes from the StatLib repository. These are 20,000 or so neighborhoods in California. What we're going to try and predict is the median house value from uh, other attributes of the neighborhood, the median income in the neighborhood, the age of the houses in the neighborhood, the size of the houses, population, occupancy, and then location, the latitude and longitude of the neighborhood. Okay, here are some pictures that represent the results of the analysis. Okay, I'll go through them. This is just a plot of housing, a histogram of housing price. This is the distribution of housing, 20,000 housing price. This is in the data set. And you'll notice something a little strange here. There's a big spike at five at the top. Okay. Now, it may be that there are a lot of neighborhoods that have exactly 500,000 median price, but I doubt it. I think what happened is that when the people put the uh, data set together for their analysis, their procedure could not deal with the outliers, and so they just truncated the data at five. So all we know about them is that they are five or greater. We do not know what their value is. We know they're greater than five. So we'll treat those as censored. These we will assume we know the actual value. So this is a mixture of censored and uncensored. Okay, here is, the res here is the location diagnostic. Here I'm plotting the value of y against the predicted value of y. And as you know, that should follow a straight line, in particular that the median of uh, y given the predicted value should be the predicted value. The uh, dots are, are the uh, y versus the predicted prediction. The red line is a running median smooth. So it is looking at the median of y given a location prediction. And then uh, the blue is a horizontal line. And the diagnostic is, does the red follow the blue? Here's the corresponding plot for, this, for, for the scale function. And here what I've plotted is the absolute residual divided by the log of 3 versus the predicted scale. And the median of this quantity should, uh, the median of this quantity should be the predictive scale. So again, the red is a running median smooth. The blue is the diagonal line. And again, if things are working well, they should line up. And you see that they do pretty well. Okay. This is a plot of the predicted location, that is the predicted housing value, versus the predicted uncertainty in that prediction, namely the estimated uncertainty in your prediction. And several things to notice here. First of all, uh, neighborhoods with uh, lower predicted housing value tend to be more accurately predicted than higher ones, although it's not universal. Another thing we see is that these scales are varying by about a factor of 20. So that in this model, when we are predicting the value of housing price, some of our predictions are 20 times more accurate than others. Same model. It's just that when we predict here, it's 20 times more accurate than maybe when we predict over here, if this is the predictor variable space. Okay, and you can see that here. This is 0.05. This is a scale value of 0.05. This is a scale value of 1. That's 20. So that we're far, far, far away from uh, homoscedasticity. That if, for example, suppose we predict uh, a value uh, here of 5, which is 500,000 median, Okay, we see that some of the predictions have an error of around 0.2, 5 plus or minus 0.2. Others have an error of 5 plus or minus 1 for the same prediction. Down here, you, you see a similar effect. Okay, here is, since this is, this is uh, 
a talk. Uh, this is a session on try to, trying to visualize models. <clears throat> Here's a visualization using variable importance and partial dependence plots. Okay, this is the importance of the variables to that model for predicting the location function. That is for predicting housing price. And you see that the income, pe the income of the people in the neighborhood, no surprise there, is the most important. All right, uh, then where the neighborhood is, longitude and latitude is very location, location. Okay, and then the others are less important. Okay, this is the partial dependence on income, and you see the higher the income in the neighborhood, the uh, uh, more houses tend to cost there, and you can interpret these other plots similarly. Okay. This is old stuff. Uh, variable importance and partial dependence plots have been around for a long, long time now. Okay, but, okay, uh, but here we can do the same thing with the scale function. Scale function is a black box function. We can use any technique we want to try and investigate it. And here again, here we see occupancy is the uh, most important variable in predicting the error, <coughs> uh, in, or in uh, estimating the error of your predictions. And here what it says is that as the occupancy goes down, the uh, predictions become more accurate. And as income goes up, the predictions become less accurate. Okay, this is another data set. And this is a data set where every observation is censored. There are no complete measurements. Okay, this is questionnaire data. Uh, about 9,000 questionnaires filled out by shopping mall customers in the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. And they filled out their demographics. One of the demographics that uh, each person who filled out a questionnaire indicated was their age. And we're going to try and predict the age based upon uh, the other demographic variables. Now, the thing is, people didn't write down their age. What they wrote down was they, there were uh, uh, what seven intervals here of age, and they put a, a mark in what, whatever interval their age was. So some people uh, were from 14 to 17, some were 18 to 24, some were over 65, and that's all you know about each person's age. You do not know what their age is. You only know that the age lies in these intervals. But what you'd like to do is predict the person's age, not which interval he's in. If you can predict his age, of course, you can predict what interval he's in. But you want more. You'd actually like to predict the person's age. OK. So here are the things we're going to, uh, variables we're going to use to try and predict the person's age. The uh, other demographic variables. Some are categorical. Some are numeric. OK. Now here, the algorithm was run, but we cannot look at those residual plots. We can't plot y versus y hat because we don't know the value of y. We only know ranges for the value of y. So the only thing we can look at is if f is, has some value, I mean, the, the thing that we can compute if we know the location and scale, we can compute a prob for each prediction, we have a probability distribution for that variable. Not just a number, but a whole probability distribution. And we can predict the probability that that observation is in each of the bins. And we know how many y's are in each of the bins, because that's the information we have. We don't have the value of y, but we know it's been in. So what this is looking at is kind of a visual uh, representation of the confusion matrix. These are all the ones that were predicted to be in bin 1. That is, everyone who was predicted to have an age between 13 and 17. The black is how many y's were observed in that bin, how many people actually had ages from 13 to 17. Okay, and the gray is our prediction for how many should be in that bin. And we see that most of them are, and uh, uh, most of them are, there are a few in bin two. Here is those that were predicted to be in two. They are mostly in bin two, but some are in bin one and some are in bin three, and so on. So how you judge whether the model is consistent is you look at, compare the height of the black bars to the height of the gray bars. The gray bars are the prediction from the model, given the location and scale. The black bars are what actually happened. And this is all we can do here, because we don't know the actual value of y. We don't, we don't have any real errors. OK, here is a plot of the predicted age versus the predicted uncertainty in age. 
And you see that, again, the heteroscedasticity is rather massive. It goes from 0.5 to 10. It's another factor of 20. So this is far, far, far from being homoscedastic. And you see that typically when you're over 40, when it's predicting over 40, that's 40 plus or minus five years typically. Sometimes it goes up to 10 years, sometimes it's down to three and a half years, but it's in this range. But when your age is, is low, like from 13 to 17, the model claims it's predicting that very accurately. Here the error is around 0.5. So we're predicting young people's ages, most of them, plus or minus half a year. Which you might wonder, our bins are three years wide there. How can we do that? You can do that with this method. Okay, but we notice some, some predictions, like here, here is a, a someone who we predicted to have age, uh, say, 14 or 15, whatever this is. No, it's more like uh, 10 or 11, okay, but with an error of two, and here's someone else we predict has the same age, but here we're much more certain about the prediction for this person than we are for the prediction of that person. Okay, I was... Time is running short, so I will skip the, well, I'll, I'll show you this is kind of, uh, shows that the model kind of makes sense. Okay, here are the importance of the variables for predicting age. The most important variable is occupation. Occupation, of course, is a categorical variable. And so what this shows is that if you have opt, uh, occupation six, uh, that tends to decrease the estimate of your age if you have, uh, if you have occupation eight, it tends to increase the estimate of your age. Occupation six is student, and occupation eight is retired. So this is saying if, if you're a student, uh, it's gonna, you, you're gonna tend to have a lower age. If you're retired, you're gonna tend to have a higher age. And uh, so on, this is uh, householder status. That is, uh, whether you own the home you live in or whether uh, you live with your, uh, whether you're renting or whether you live with your parents. And you see that if you own your home, that tends to increase the estimate of the age. And if you live with your parents, that tends to decrease the estimate of the age. OK, here's the same thing for the scale model. Keep in mind, it's a function of x. When we make a prediction, we have two functions of, of the same x. f of x is our prediction, and s of x is our uncertainty in that prediction. And so we're getting two numbers for each prediction, not just one. Okay, so here it says that householder status is the most important variable for predicting age, followed by marital status, etc. Okay, what this says is this is uh, this is yeah householder status, and what it, I think that's household. It might yeah it's householder status. What it says is if you live with your parents that decreases the uncertainty in its prediction of your age. Notice on the previous plot, it said it reduced the estimate of your age. It also reduced the uncertainty. It's pretty sure if you live with your parents. The model is saying, I'm pretty sure if you live with your parents that uh, this is a pretty accurate estimate of your age. Whereas if you own your house, it's, uh, it gets a little less accurate. Same thing with occupation down here. This is student. Okay, if you're a student, that really decreases the uncertainty that, in, that the model thinks it has on predicting age. Whereas for retired, it's uh, much less certain on the age. Okay, the next data set, how am I doing? Oh, all right. The next data set, and I'll go through this one quickly, is a data set from the Irvine Repository. It's the wine quality data set. And there's about 6,500 samples of wine, okay. The uh, thing we're going to try and predict is the quality of wine as judged from experts. And so a lot of experts drank these wines. And the actual, what we're going to see is uh, the median of at least three expert evaluations of the wine. And what we're going to try and do is predict how good the wine is from various chemical characteristics that can be measured on it. Okay? Now, you may think this is a standard regression problem where I'll just it's just that the outcome has integer values. But wine quality is not an integer. It's a continuously varying thing. It's just that we chose to measure it 
as an integer. So I'm going to treat this as censored. Namely, if, if the judge says four, I'm going to assume that is that judge is saying that's somewhere between three and a half and four and a half. And when the judge says eight, it's somewhere between seven and a half and eight and a half. Okay, these are the things we're going to try and predict from. These are the predictor variables, and they are various, uh, as I said, uh, chemical characteristics. Here again, we don't really know the value of the quality. We just have the integer, which says what bin it's in. And here, this is the confusion matrix, both actual and predicted, and you see they're very close. Okay, here is a plot of the uh, predicted quality versus the uncertainty in predictive quality. And you see that for the higher end lines, the ones that were six and a half and seven, the uncertainty is a little higher. That means the judges are, are, just, are, are agreeing slightly less. But this range is not so big. This goes from 0.15 to 0.3. That's only a factor of two. So here the heteroscedasticity is not so large. All right, I will, oh, just one thing. Uh, here are the variable importances, and you see by far the most important variable is the concentration of alcohol. And uh, from the partial dependence plots, you see that the more alcohol that there is in the wine, the more the judge liked it. Uh, here are the 9 percenters and here are the 13 percenters. Okay, the other was acidity. Okay, here's the scale function. Again, uh, we'll skip that and I want to finish with, uh, well actually I'd like to do more, but I will finish with ordered multi-class logistic regression. That is, this is the case where you have a classification problem, but the class labels are ordered. Okay. Now you could treat, you could ignore the ordering and treat it as an unordered classification problem, but you're massively throwing away information. Because really there's only one or two functions you need to estimate, as you'll see in a moment. But let's say there were 20 levels, you'd be estimating 19 or 20 functions if you treat it unordered and have very much worse accuracy. All right. So the problem here is that we know that y, uh, is in one, has one of these labels, and the labels are ordered. As I said before, small, medium, large, extra large, A, B, C, D, F, uh, number of stars, number of whatever, where we know which observations are in each class. We know that observations in a lower class are all less than those in an upper class. Okay, we can treat this as a censored problem just like we did with age and just like we did with wine quality. Break up Y into a set of bins, and the bins will be small. Everyone who's small will go in the first bin. Everyone who's medium will go in the second bin, and so on. Okay, And treat it just like we treated it before, except we don't know the boundaries of the bins. Okay. In fact, we'd like to know that because that'll tell us the scale. That'll tell us where extra large is three times as bigger than large, whereas small is only uh, twice as small as uh, big. So how do we do that? We set it up exactly the way I did the previous two. We, we divide into bins. We put small, medium, large, and extra large, or whatever, one, two, three, four stars, in each bin. Okay, and proceed as before, but instead of minimizing our loss function with respect to just the location and scale function, we're going to minimize it with respect to the bin values too. We don't know the bin values, so let's try and find the bin values that can be best predicted by, the, by F and scale function S. Okay, and the way we're going to do that is alternating optimization. We'll make a guess at the bin values in order. We will solve the problem just as we did before. That gives us an F and an S, a location and scale. Then given that location and scale, we will minimize this with respect to the uh, bin boundaries, which is very easy, by the way. And then once you have those bin boundaries, you go back and estimate F and S again, and you alternate. So here is an example. I, I took the wine example. I'll be done in two minutes. I took the wine example, and you might suspect with the wine example, you know, we had this scale from 1 to 10. One thing we might suspect is, or, or we can ask the question, is the difference in quality between one, 
a, a wine ranked eight from that which was ranked seven, is that the same difference as one that was ranked two compared to one that was ranked three? You would, you know, and there's no reason why that should be true. I mean, you know, these are human testers and maybe uh, uh, that's not a linear scale. So what I thought I would do is I would run this algorithm on that data pretending I don't know what the bin boundaries are and, and see what it comes up with. Okay, so I start out with the original boundaries based upon the, the integers that the uh, wine tasters assign. I run, this is at the first iteration, okay, what it found. This is the second and this is the third. And what it said is that those wine tasters are mighty good because the difference between a eight and a seven in quality, at least as judged by the tasters, is about the same as the difference between a two and a three. So I thought, well, maybe, it's just the algorithm, it got stuck, you know, it just didn't move. So I put in a different set of bin boundaries. I said, let's pretend that a two is very close to a three, but a seven is very far from an eight. I basically exponentiated the scale. Ran the algorithm and you see where it came out. Came out just where it came out before. It does like the scale that the wine people actually used. All right, since so I'm out of time, I won't talk about asymmetric distributions, only to say that what makes us think that the error distribution is symmetric? We've been assuming that all along. I mean, if we're willing to admit heteroscedasticity, that the scale may change for different predictions, why can't, you know, the upper and lower scales change? But I'll skip that. It's, it'll be in the notes. And, oh, and I will summarize. Okay, so what I've tried to describe is a robust procedure, namely it will not get fooled by outliers at all, okay, to estimate the location, well, let me put, let's start out here. What we would like to do is predict the value of Y given a set of predictor variables. We can't do that because of those pesky Zs. Other things are driving the distribution of Y that uh, we can't control or observe. So we can't predict Y uh, given X, we settle for predicting the distribution of Y given X. That distribution has a location that we'll use to predict Y and a scale which we'll use to assess the uncertainty in our prediction of Y. Okay, and we've done it based on the logistic distribution, could have done it based on the normal distribution, but that would not be a very useful procedure because it would lack robustness. The minute you had a few outliers, it would fall apart, where the logistic distribution does not fall apart in the presence of outliers, okay? I've talked about general censoring, which I believe in practice is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. We tend to try to work around it with approximations and we'll suffer accuracy because of it. We see, and, and in fact, the application that drove this, why I started working on this, was an industrial application where we had half the data were censored at zero, namely, we only knew they were less than zero. Of the other half, half was censored from below at zero, we only knew they were above zero. And then the other quarter we actually know the value of. Okay, and we wanted to use all of that data to build our model not just the data that we had the actual Y value for. Okay, so that's what drove this, uh, this work. Okay, I've provided some graphical diagnostic. I've discussed ordered multi-class classification, where you not only get the classification, you estimate the scale. So you, and then finally, which I didn't talk about, was asymmetric distributions, which you can do in exactly the same way. And it's in the notes, and when I write the paper, it'll be in the paper. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the great, uh, thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, we have time for one question, if uh, somebody wants to uh, come to the microphone. Uh, I have a question. Uh, we we uh, the, we tried the log logistic distributions in uh, real data, and it seemed to fit well. Any? I'm sorry. The what? The log log logistic distribution, which is exponential. That's what, what I'm using. Yeah. Well, log log, log logistic. logistic. Well, it has heavier tail. Keep heavier in tail. mind, I am using. Well, it's exactly what I'm doing here, except I'm estimating scale with it as well as location, because. I'm using the logistic distribution. That's the likelihood. The loss is the negative log likelihood. So your actual loss is log logistic. 
I mean, that's what it is. Thank you very much.